So today we are going to talk about the U.S. and Canada. Today, it's the last section of notes. This is where we kind of talk about the entire area we were just talking about as, an, as a whole. Um, so we're going to talk about the U.S. and Canada combined today. Okay, so United States and Canada are both industrialized countries. Um, we know this. They're very modern countries. They're considered to be first world countries. Um, and this is some of the reason why they are considered first world or heavily industrialized. So um, the United States and Canada has actually moved into what's called the post-industrial period. And what this means is we have less reliance on heavy machinery, um, manufacturing, um, less people work jobs making stuff. Now, most people work in jobs providing a service um, about certain things, or they work in technology. Um, so 75% of the workforce in the United States and Canada work in service industries. And I know what you're thinking, well, what's a service industry? A service industry is a job where you are providing a service. So think, think of jobs where you're not making something, you're providing a service, your expertise on something. And I'll give you a really simple one, a barber right? Or a hairstylist, right? They're not selling you a product. Like they didn't make something and then you're buying that something from them. You're going to them because they're going to cut your hair and they're going to make you look good, right? They're going to make your haircut look good. Um, where, I mean, anyone could cut their hair, but not everyone can cut their hair well. So that's why you pay money to go get it cut by someone who's professional and knows what they're doing, right? A doctor, a dentist, a lawyer, um, a teacher, they're all service industry, right? They provide a service. You know, a doctor doesn't necessarily sell you a product. The doctor sells you his expertise or knowledge about your health, okay? Um, so 75% of the workforce in the United States and Canada work in service industries. Um, High-tech industries are less dependent on location, which means they give people a choice of living. They can choose where they want to live. So if you're like a computer coder or an electrical engineer, a computer engineer, you don't have to live in a certain place to do that job. You can live anywhere and do that job. Um, whereas if you worked at, say, I don't know, a rubber tire plant where you're making rubber tires, you have to you have to live in a place where they have those factories. Or if you work at a steel mill, right, you have to live in an area that is a part of the steel industry. You can't live anywhere. You have to go where those jobs are at. But with service industry jobs and high tech jobs, you can do those jobs pretty much anywhere in the country. Like I could be a teacher here. I could be a teacher in Arizona. I could be a teacher in Montana. I could be a teacher in California. Like I could go and teach wherever I want to teach at. Um, the location is not really dependent on my job. I can go do my job anywhere that I want to go. Um, but I chose to do it here. Right. So um, that's part of the reason why they're considered post-industrial now. Now we do still have manufacturing jobs, um, but not as many as we used to. Um, about 20% of the US and Canadian economy is manufacturing. Um, manufacturing has completely changed over the past 20 years or so. And that's because robotics have transformed the industry. Um, you can make more stuff with fewer physical workers. Um, and so like an example is like the automotive industry, right? They used to make all kinds of cars in Ford Heights. I'm sure you guys have heard of Ford Heights before. If you just drive down 30, Route 30 towards Illinois, you would drive right through Ford Heights. They used to have a gigantic Ford plant there and they used to make all kinds of Ford cars there. Um, they don't make as many cars there. Um, in fact, I think they're actually talking about closing the factory in the next couple of years. And it's because now they have these robots like this that will be on these assembly lines and they pretty much do everything. So like um, my uncle used to work at Ford and his job was he would put door handles, like, you know, the handle you grab to open a car door. That was his job. He just sat there on an assembly line and he would put door handles on the two doors because he would only do one side of the car and there would be someone else on the other side of the car and they would do that side and he would do this side and he would just put door handles on the car as they would go down the assembly line. And that's all he did all day for eight hours a day. He just put door handles on. Now they have a robot that puts the door on, the door handles, the glass, the trim, it does everything, right? There's just a human being sitting there watching the machine, making sure that it's working. Because of this, 
There's been a huge loss of jobs and complete closure of factories, um, especially in the Rust Belt, which is the Great Lakes area. Um, it's a nickname it got, the Rust Belt, because of the factories. And now that the factories are closing, they call it the Rust Belt. Because think of like when you leave a bike outside and you abandon it and you don't use it at all, it just rusts, right? Well, that's what's happened to the old factory buildings. They've rusted and started falling apart and, and all that. Also a part of manufacturing is the transportation industry. So if you drove semi trucks or you flew planes or you were like a train operator or you were like a, you would drive like big ships um, that would transport all these manufactured goods. So think like steel mills, right? They would load that steel onto trucks, they would load it onto boats and they would ship it out to other parts of the country or the world. Um, there aren't as many of those jobs either because they're making less, now, right? Agriculture, 5% of, or it's about 5% of our economy. Agriculture, it's mainly owned by large corporations now. Um, they were family owned. A majority of farms are family owned, but the biggest owners of farmland are these huge corporations. There's about 1 billion acres of farmland in the United States and 167 million acres in Canada. Um, some of the key things that we make and produce are cattle, um, along with cattle, you have like meat, right? The meat industry, um, and also with that dairy industry, right? So if you have cows, you'll have dairy cows where you produce milk, and you sell milk to the grocery stores. Um, wheat, grain, like wheat, barley, hops, that type of stuff. And then corn, beans, and squash. Those are all key products that we manufacture or produce and grow here in the States and in Canada. Um, there's been a big decline in the number of farms since the 1950s. And the reason for that is technology, right? Um, back in the day, like in the 50s and 60s, um, they would grow things organically because there wasn't any other option. That's all they knew at the time. But then you had genetic scientists figure out how to modify the genetic code of corn and tomatoes and wheat and all these different crops and make them bigger. So now a stalk of corn, like back in the day, a stalk of corn used to be like maybe four or five inches long. And it would be like maybe that big around. Um, but now a stalk of corn is this big around and it'll be like 12 inches long like this. Um, so now you don't have to plant as much corn because the corn is bigger because it's been genetically modified. Um, and so because of that, there's been a big decline in farming because you can grow more with less now. So that was a technological improvement that made that decline. Hey, trade, um, we live in a global economy. This is really important to understand. Um, we live in a worldwide economy. It used to be um, everything you would have would be made here. Um, and that's all you could get. Um, but now our economies are connected and depend on one another for trade. Um, so now like if we want electronics, we buy our electronics from China. They're designed in Japan or they're designed in the States, but they're manufactured in China. So we trade stuff that China needs to China and then they trade to us electronics and clothing and manufactured goods. And so we're reliant on one another, right? China relies on us for certain products and we rely on them for certain products. Um, and that's important to understand because that has huge ramifications in the relations of our countries. The United States has a trade deficit um, which means that we actually lose money on trade. Um, because if you think about it, the stuff that we trade is like cars and airplanes and uh, stuff like that. And they're trading us t-shirts and jeans and shoes and stuff like that. And so we're trading like a Boeing 747 for, you know, a billion dollars worth of clothes. That's it, not worth as much, right? So that's, we're taking a loss there. It's a, it's a trade deficit where Canada has a trade surplus um, because they only trade um, for things and they make money on their trade. So what they trade out is worth more than what they get in. Um, that's the way the United States is. So we trade more expensive things to receive less expensive things, where in Canada, they're trading less expensive things and getting more expensive things back. So they're making money, they have a surplus. Um, and the reason for this is because of NAFTA, which stands for the North American Free Trade Agreement. Um, you might want to like write that down on paper or whatever. You can Google it and look it up, but it stands for North American Free Trade Agreement. That's what NAFTA stands for. It was created in 1994 in the United States by President Bill Clinton. 
and uh, he proposed it with um, the Prime Minister of Canada and Mexico, and they came up with the agreement that there would be no tariffs, and a tariff is a tax on an imported good. So for, to give you an example of a tariff, let's say you want to buy avocados from Mexico. There's a tariff for that. And what that tariff is, is a tax. So if you buy avocados from Mexico, you have to pay a 15% tax to get those avocados on top of what it costs in the normal sales tax. Um, where if you buy an avocado just that's made in the States, you just have to pay sales tax. You don't have to pay the tariff. And so the idea of tariffs is it it's a protectionist um, idea. So it protects American farmers who grow avocados from Mexican farmers who grow avocados. Um, and the idea that it makes sense on paper, right? Like you can protect certain industries with tariffs. The problem is, is those tariffs add up and the people who pay them are you, the, the consumer, the people who wants to buy it. So you're paying a tax um, to protect an American farmer um, because the government thinks that the American farmer needs to be protected. And ultimately what it was a result of NAFTA was it's created outsourcing. And outsourcing is where companies will be American companies, but they will close their shops here in the United States and they will move their factory or their, their business outside of the country. So they set up jobs outside the country for cheap labor. So in like, for example, in 1994, Chevy and Ford closed factories in the United States and they moved their factories to Canada and Mexico. Um, and so a lot of American factory workers lost their jobs at Chevy and Ford because they moved the factories to Canada and Mexico because they could pay um, Canadians and Mexicans less money to work and make the exact same car. So it allowed Chevy and Ford to make more money because they could bring, they could sell the car from Mexico into the United States with no tariffs, but then they could get cheaper labor in Canada and Mexico. And this hurt the American economy. So what ultimately ended up happening is people lost their jobs and the cost of products went up a little bit. Okay, so this led to high prices on products and a big loss of jobs. Um, NAFTA was replaced in 2020 um, by the United States, Mexico and Canada agreement, which was negotiated by Donald Trump and Justin Trudeau and the president of Mexico. And they came up with a new agreement and it's very similar to NAFTA, but it has caps, like a certain amount of outsourcing can happen. And as a result of this, um, you've seen factories like car factories, like Chevy and Ford's factories in Mexico and Canada get smaller. And some of those jobs came back into the United States. Um, but there's still high prices on labor and there were still tariffs, but they were put in place in a different way. It's still very confusing. Okay. And this just shows how these jobs that are service jobs make up the outsourcing. So initially it was manufacturing jobs got outsourced, but now we're starting to see service industry jobs get outsourced. You know, just think, uh, you know, IT or tech support. I mean, how many times have you had a call like Sony or Comcast or whatever to get help on your TV or you know, your PlayStation or whatever, and the person you're talking to is not in the United States. They're from somewhere else, right? It happens a lot. Okay, so that is it for the notes. So thanks for following along. And if you guys have any questions, email me or let me know. All right, thanks.